Hello everyone, this is Paleo Nerd here with a brand new Jurassic Fight Club analysis. Today we'll be analyzing the 10th episode, River of Death, which takes place 70 million years ago in what is now Alberta, Canada, and features a fight between two Albertosaurus and a herd of what the show calls Pachyrhinosaurus. This episode has a similar problem as in Ice Age Monsters in terms of the date, as the site this episode is based on actually dates to about 73 million years ago, 3 million years before the episode is set. Once again, the people making the show probably rounded down to make it simpler, but the problem here is that this seemingly minor issue actually creates major problems with the combatants. Mainly the Pachyrhinosaurus, I'm putting it in quotes, now, we'll get to that abomination soon enough, but we'll start the analysis with its opponent, Albertosaurus. Albertosaurus sarcophagus, or flesh-eating Alberta lizard, is an Albertosaurian tyrannosaurid which lived from 71 to 68 million years ago, during the Middle Maastrichtian Age of the Late Cretaceous, in what is now Canada, specifically the province of Alberta, from, what it, from which it gets its generic name. It is one of the most well-known Tyrannosaurids, with over 30 individuals discovered. It was very large as well, at a length of 90 to 10 meters or 30 to 33 feet long, a height of about 2.5 meters or 8 feet tall at the shoulder, and a weight of 1.5 to 2 tons. Fossils of Albertosaurus are mainly found in the Upper Horseshoe Formation, although some possible remains have been found in the St. Mary River Formation. In both formations, Albertosaurus is the largest predator found, meaning it was likely an apex predator, preying on large herbivorous dinosaurs, mainly hadrosaurs like Sorolophus, Hypocrosaurus, and Edmontosaurus, as well as ceratopsians like Regaloceratops, Aotriceratops, and of course Pachyrhinosaurus. Albertosaurus also has preserved evidence of possible pack behavior, as a discovery was made of 26 individuals all in the same place, of many different ages and with no herbivores present. This has led to the theory that Tyrannosaurids hunted and lived in family groups, Although paleontologists have offered other alternatives, such as that the animals were simply driven to this one place by a drought or a flood. Well, now let's see how Jurassic Fight Club's version compares. First off, Albertosaurus is not known from 73 million years ago, although it is definitely possible that it did exist at this time. And since the Albertosaur known from the site the episode is based on is indeterminate, I'll be sticking with Albertosaurus for the fight. When it comes to the size, the length is good, but it's much taller than the real animal at 11 feet or 3.3 meters tall at the shoulder, and Jurassic Fight Club's version is also heavier, weighing 3 tons instead of 2. In terms of design, Jurassic Fight Club's Albertosaurus is much more gracile and thinner than the real animal, more closely resembling a juvenile or sub-adult than a fully grown individual. This is common in many depictions of both Albertosaurus and its close relative Gorgosaurus, as juvenile specimens are more commonly found than adults are. The real animal wasn't as robust as Tyrannosaurus, but it was decently heavily built, whereas Jurassic Fight Club's version looks like its legs should crack under their own weight. Besides that, it has the typical theropod inaccuracies, pronated hands looking like it has a severe case of anorexia, a tail in need of straightening, and a, also a lack of filaments of any kind. Considering the fact that Albertosaurus lives somewhat far north where it could get pretty cold, chances are that it had at least some filament coverings. I'm not saying it was fluffy, just that it shouldn't be completely naked. Speaking of living up north, the show gives Albertosaurus a range from as far north as Alaska to as far south as Texas, 
when Albertosaurus has only ever been found in Alberta, Canada, indicating it didn't travel much. There were other Tyrannosaurids that lived during the same time, which did live in those areas, but they were not Albertosaurus. Finally, there's a part where it suggested that Albertosaurus coexisted with Ankylosaurus, which appeared almost immediately after Albertosaurus' extinction. Albertosaurus fed on horned dinosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs, and even the armored Ankylosaurus. Albertosaurus did coexist with the similar Anodontosaurus, but not Ankylosaurus. Now we have this thing. If the show hadn't told me that this was supposed to be Pachyrhinosaurus, I probably wouldn't be able to identify this animal. Right off the bat, this episode is based on a bone bed in Pipestone Creek, Alberta, which contains the species Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, or lacustus thick-nosed lizard. However, this species did not coexist with Albertosaurus. The species that did was Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis, or Canadian thick-nosed lizard. Pete Lacustae was also extinct by the time this episode was set, living from 73 to 72 million years ago, while P. condensis fits the time period be better, having lived about 71 to 70 million years ago. So I will be using P. condensis as reference for the fight itself, although I will use Lacustae for the what really happened section. This is all pointless anyway, because if you take one look at a real Pachyrhinosaurus and then look back at this monstrosity, you can clearly tell that they are not the same animal. The main problem is the head, but first let's talk about something a bit more on the nose. As most people know, this show's version of Pachyrhinosaurus is famous, or rather infamous, for the horn they put on its nose. Anyone who knows anything about Pachyrhinosaurus can tell you that probably the most unique thing about Pachyrhinosaurus is the lack of a nose horn, which was replaced with massive flattened bony surfaces called bosses above the animal's eyes and nose. The idea that Pachyrhinosaurus had a nose horn is based on an outdated fringe theory, suggesting that the bosses on Pachyrhinosaurus may have actually supported a horn made of keratin like that of rhinos. I know this because the show literally makes the same argument. The first thing you notice is this big lumpy mass on the end of its nose. We call that a boss. Well, some paleontologists believe that it housed a gigantic horn like the horn of a rhinoceros. With almost every known dinosaur, their horns are made of bone. But in the case of Pachyrhinosaurus, we think that that horn could have been made of either hair or keratin like our fingernails. And that stuff decomposes when the animal dies. Of course, Jurassic Fight Club wasn't the first and certainly not the only piece of media to give Pachyrhinosaurus a horn, as the anime Dinosaur King actually beat them, beat them to it. And unfortunately, it seems like people haven't quite learned their lesson, as horned Pachyrhinosaurus has appeared as lately as an NHK dino documentary called Dinosaur Super World, except I think this design is actually much worse than Jurassic Fight Clubs. Anyway, this idea was actually debunked by the same people who proposed the idea in the first place, as studies on the structure and rugosity of the bosses have shown that the structures do not represent the base of a horn, and would have resembled a bump, just like Pachyrhinosaurus is commonly depicted. Of course, the people working on the show likely knew this, and probably deliberately chose to be inaccurate and give Pachyrhinosaurus a horn because they think horns are cooler than bumps, and as we all know, this show cares much more about looking cool and being awesome bro than it is about being accurate or teaching anybody. Even when ignoring the horn, the show's Pachyrhinosaurus has one fatal flaw in that its head is based on an entirely separate ceratopsian. That's right, based on the model as well as actual fossils they used as reference, 
the animal that this show calls Pachyrhinosaurus is actually based on Ankylosaurus horneri, or Horner's Ankylos lizard. A close relative of Pachyrhinosaurus was lived in Montana during the Campanian, about 75 to 74 million years ago, and it is commonly considered to be the ancestor of Pachyrhinosaurus. The thing I don't get is why they used Ankylosaurus. As far as I know, Ankylosaurus has never been considered a synonym of Pachyrhinosaurus, and there is a clear distinction between the two genera. Pachyrhinosaurus had a larger nose boss, and its frill horns were shorter and curved around the skull, while Ankylosauruses are longer and extend outwards away from the frill. And this isn't just the fact that the skull resembles that of Ankylosaurus. No, no, no. It looks exactly like Ankylosaurus with a horn put on its nose, from the frill horns to even the bosses above its eyes. So again, why do they do this? Frankly, I have no idea, as it literally makes no goddamn sense. The species they're supposed to be depicting Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae has plenty of material to go off of to distinguish it from Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurus lived in Montana, not Canada. The list goes on and on. I could be ranting about this for hours. It just doesn't make any damn sense. All they did was take a completely different dinosaur, call it Pachyrhinosaurus, and probably fed it a shitload of Cheetos based on how fat that dinosaur is. Unfortunately, I will have to continue calling this pathetic excuse for a dinosaur, Pachyrhinosaurus, for the sake of this analysis. But do not, I repeat, do not be fooled. Because this thing is not Pachyrhinosaurus. I just can't come up with a creative nickname for it. Remember my first episode when I claimed that Majungasaurus had the most inaccurate design in the entire series? Well, this thing proved me wrong. This animal is, by far, the most inaccurate design in this entire series. Sure, Majungasaurus was completely off in terms of body shape, but you could tell from the head that it was supposed to be Majungasaurus. Meanwhile, Pachyrhinosaurus is inaccurate both in terms of body shape and re in regards to the head, which is even more insulting because the headgear is commonly what is used to identify the genus of a ceratopsian. While I can tell that Jurassic Fight Club's Majungasaurus is a Majungasaurus, the same cannot be said for this pathetic excuse for Pachyrhinosaurus as they literally change the one thing that made it Pachyrhinosaurus, the head, and as such makes it look like a completely different dinosaur. This is by far the worst thing a dino documentary can do in terms of designing their creatures, and this show should be ashamed that they ever even considered putting out a design that looks this goddamn horrible. Now, I am confident that this time I will not be proved wrong ever, ever, ever again. Before I move on to the fight, the show continuously calls Pachyrhinosaurus the Arctic Dinosaur. However, the species that this show tried to depict, P. Lacustae, lived in southern Canada, which was not within the Arctic Circle during the late Cretaceous. In fact, the only species of Pachyrhinosaurus that lived in the Arctic was the smallest of the three, P. Peritorum, which did live around the time of the episode. However, the species in this episode is very clearly not Peritorum, as this fight takes place in Alberta. Finally, the Arctic Pachyrhinosaurus species is in no way unique like the show seems to imply, as it coexisted with a plethora of animals equally adapted for the harsh environment of Alaska during the late Cretaceous, and it even had to fend off dwarf tyrannosaurs and giant troodonts. 
That's all for co the combatants. Let's see how the fight plays out. The fight opens with a pair of Albertosaurus stalking a herd of Pachyrhinosaurus, which are feeding to prepare for their migration. However, considering that both Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis and P. lacustae, which this shows Pachyrhinosaurus is supposedly based off, have only been found in Alberta, Canada, it is unlikely that Pachyrhinosaurus was a migratory animal. George also claims that Pachyrhinosaurus wasn't as big as other Ceratopsians. Although Pachyrhinosaurus doesn't have the same massive size and weaponry as the other members of the Ceratopsian family, they're still pretty powerful and dangerous dinosaurs. However, Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis was actually pretty big for Ceratopsians at the time. At a length of 6 to 8 meters or 20 to 26 feet long, a height of about 2 meters or 6.5 feet tall to shoulder, and a weight of around 4 US tons. It is likely that George met Ceratopsians overall, in which case Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis still ranked pretty high, being among the largest of the centrosaurians and only being surpassed by chasmosaurians like Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Anyway, the Albertosaurus charge at the herd, causing them to stampede in the hopes that it will weed out the weaker members of the herd. The two predators pursue their prey towards a flooded river that the Pachyrhinosaurus are unable to cross, and the herd is forced to face their attackers. The Albertosaurus make mock charges until one Pachy breaks rank and runs into the forest. The narrator then states that Pachyrhinosaurus herds were led by a few dominant males. The Pachyrhinosaurus herds were made up of a few dominant males and a harem of females and their children. However, based on modern herd animals, it is likely that adult males live separately from the females and juveniles with the exception of breeding, occasionally grouping together with other males in bachelor herds, which would not be as large as the herds shown in this episode. Anyway, one of the Albertosaurus chases after the straggler, while the other one remains with the herd, even though it would be much more logical for both of them to chase after the straggler. The narrator states that Pachyrhinosaurus's frill was solid bone, and it is implied that the show believes it was used as a shield. The Pachyrhinosaurus frill was almost three inches thick and made of solid bone. However, Pachyrhinosaurus's frill actually has two huge holes in it, and it was incredibly thin and likely fragile, meaning a predator like Albertosaurus could probably easily bite through it. Instead, the frill is believed to be used for display purposes, perhaps to help identify others of their species, to attract mates, or to appear bigger to potential predators. Anyway, the Albertosaurus lunges forward, but ends up biting down on the horn of the Pachy's frill, breaking off some of its teeth. And the Pachyrhinosaurus tries to ram the Albertosaurus with its nose horn. I can't believe I had to say that. While George and the narrator say things about both combatants that range from being true to not quite accurate, the Pachyrhinosaurus could grow back its horn if it broke. One of the weaknesses of Albertosaurus is that it's relatively lightly built. But when you look at their skeletal design, you'll see that their bones are hollow. These hollow bones are rigid and strong, but they're very, very light. So if the Pachy gets lucky and hits a bone, it could break it without really any problem. And this would not only take the Albertosaurus out of the fight, it could very well end its life. The Albertosaurus rams the Pachyrhinosaurus in the side, knocking it over. Considering how thin Albertosaurus is compared to Tyrannosaurus, I doubt it would be able to effortlessly knock over a 4-ton animal, but please do not quote me on that. The Albertosaurus seems to take after the American Lion from the previous episode, as it doesn't attack the Pachy while it's down, and instead politely waits for the Ceratopsian to get up before attacking again. This proves to be a mistake, as the Pachy manages to plunge its horn into the Albertosaurus's leg. However, George explains that the horn somehow missed the bone and the injury is dismissed as just a minor scratch. The Pachyrhinosaurus misses the bone and only rips the skin, and this enrages the Albertosaurus. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. 
This directly contradicts what was established earlier, as it was explained that the Albertosaurus's long and thin legs were its weak spot, and yet the Pachy got in a perfect hit and the attack has no effect. Hell, the Albertosaurus doesn't even get so much as a limp. Not only is the Albertosaurus's legs such a small target that it would be near impossible to miss a bone, and even if, but even if the horn did somehow miss the bone, it would have torn up some major muscles in the lower leg, many of which are required for Albertosaurus to walk properly, meaning the Albertosaurus should at least be horribly crippled for life. Of course, the show ignores this, and all the wound really does is piss off the Albertosaurus, who promptly kills the Packy by biting it in the neck. Yes, it's really that anticlimactic. Meanwhile, the other Albertosaurus is still confronting the rest of the Pachyrhinosaurus herd, who somehow haven't just used their numbers and trampled the Albertosaurus to death. The narrator claims that Albertosaurus had an endless hunger, which is complete bullshit. Its endless appetite drove it to savage butchery. A decently large meal would be more than enough to keep an Albertosaurus fed for several days, so it didn't need to constantly hunt for food any more than modern predators like lions or bears or even birds of prey like hawks and eagles. As the Albertosaurus continues to drive the herd back, they begin to fall into the river one by one, and their sheer numbers cause them to drown each other. Tempted by the meal, but somehow smart enough not to jump in after them, the Albertosaurus begins to follow the herd down the river, and eventually the carcasses of the herd wash up on the side of the river. Now with more carcasses than he can eat, the Albertosaurus begins to feast on the corpses, pretty much making that one-on-one -on -one fight completely pointless, since it turns out that the other Albertosaurus would have gotten a free meal with no injuries if it had just stayed with its mate driving the herd into the river. Of course, if this fight was realistic, it would be the other way around, with the Albertosaurus that stayed behind with the herd being killed instantly, while the one that chased after the straggler would have a better chance of getting a kill. So yeah, typical Jurassic Fight Club episode completely falls apart if you imply any sort of logic to it. There is really only one other major inaccuracy in this episode, and that is the whole Arctic Dinosaurs thing. Throughout the episode, the narrator goes on referring to both Albertosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus as Arctic Dinosaurs, when in actuality neither Albertosaurus nor Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis or Lacusai lived within the Arctic Circle. It is possible they were trying to make reference to the Prince Creek fauna which lived in the northern tip of Alaska, mainly Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum and Nanuxaurus, which at the time the episode was made was thought to be an Arctic species of either Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus. If that is the case, they picked the wrong episode to do that, since the discovery they were restoring was not in Prince Creek, but southern Canada. The show also states that the late Cretaceous was the first time that dinosaurs had experienced cold weather or snow, however this just isn't true. While it probably didn't snow, Antarctica was still pretty cold since the early Jurassic, and the discovery of Cryolophosaurus there proves that dinosaurs could survive in cold weather. However, the most common dinosaurs that were known to endure cold weather and maybe even snow lived during the early Cretaceous. There was the Wessex Formation in England from the Barremian about 130 to 125 million years ago. There was the Yishan Formation in China from the Barremian to the Aptian about 130 to 122 million years ago, and there was Dinosaur Cove in Australia from the Aptian and Albion about 120 to 100 million years ago. And for the record, all three of these sites were known and had plenty of fossils by the time this episode was produced, so you can't go in the comments claiming that this show couldn't have known this because they definitely could have if they bothered to do any fucking research. So, needless to say, dinosaurs definitely dealt with cold weather and snow long before this episode was set, 
And judging by how many of them there were, dinosaurs did pretty well in the cold. That's really all I can think of right now, so let's move on to what really happened. As stated before, this episode is based on a dinosaur bone bed in Pipestone Creek in Alberta, Canada, which revealed a large quantity of Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, as well as teeth belonging to an Alberta saurine. The site also has remains of fish, turtles, crocodilians, lizards, a troodont, and the Dromaeosaur Boreonychus, which is considered a species of Sauronithalestes at the time this episode was made. But again, the people making this show didn't seem to think these animals were important. If you listened closely, you'll notice that I said Albertosaurine teeth, not Albertosaurus. As in, we don't actually know what genus the teeth belong to. The Wapiti Formation, which Pipestone Creek lies in, dates to the late Companion Age of the Lake Cretaceous, about 73 million years ago, which doesn't fit the temporal range of either Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus. As Gorgosaurus lived from 76 to 75 million years ago, while Albertosaurus lived from 71 to 68 million years ago. Considering the fact that Albertosaurus is closer to the date of the formation, I'd place my bet on that, but who knows, maybe Gorgosaurus did survive until 73 million years ago. Or maybe it's a completely new Albertosaurian, maybe a transition between Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus. The last one is probably unlikely, but keep in mind that I am in no way suggesting that Albertosaurus is definitely 100% the owner of the Pipestone Creek team. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Chances are we probably won't know until we find more complete remains, and even then we might get caught up in another Gorgosaurus versus Albertosaurus argument. Anyway, what actually happened at this site and how accurately did Jurassic Fight Club portray it? Well, from what I can tell, Jurassic Fight Club was almost spot on with this discovery. Almost. Chances are that the massive amount of Pachyrhinosaurus at the site was indeed the result of a massive flood, but they probably weren't driven in by Albertosaurus, and if they were, it definitely wasn't only two Albertosaurus. Also, the one-on-one -on -one fight probably didn't happen either, they probably just wanted to put in an actual fight in the episode which eliminates a possible message that this episode could have tried to convey, that Mother Nature is a bigger killer than predators will ever be. The show did talk about this back in Biggest Killers, but here it could have made a bigger impact because people are more likely to actually watch this episode because it has an actual fight. Once again, I will bring up another documentary which did something much similar, but also much better than Jurassic Fight Club did. That documentary is Planet Dinosaur. Now, people seem to have a lot of harsh opinions about Planet Dinosaur, and don't worry, I will cover it in the future, but I personally don't think it's that bad, although I can see why some people might dislike it. I do hope we can at least agree that it is better than Jurassic Fight Club. Anyways, there's a scene in Planet Dinosaur's third episode where a massive herd of Centrosaurus is migrating, only to be intercepted by a bunch of Dusplitosaurus, which have purposely congregated there to feed. Mass carnage ensues, and with some Dusplitosaurus making a kill, and as the herd tries to escape, they find that a storm has caused the river to flood. Being caught between a rock and a hard place, the Centrosaurus are forced to cross the river, where many of them drown and the Dusplitosaurus return later after the flood to feed on the remaining corpses. It's not exactly the same as Jurassic Fight Club's version, mostly in the fact that it uses a different bone bed and it replaces Pachyrhinosaurus with Centrosaurus and Albertosaurus with Dusplitosaurus, but once again there is a major difference in regards to realism and plausibility. Chances are what happened at Pipestone Creek was probably at least somewhat similar to the planet dinosaur scene. A herd of Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae are forced to swim across a flooded river and most of them drown. 
When the flood is over, the massive amount of carcasses attract Tyrannosaurus, possibly Albertosaurus, who begin to feed on the carcasses, leaving only their teeth behind. Once again, no fight, no gore, no unnecessary violence. Overall, this episode is pretty terrible in terms of inaccuracy. Although probably more T-Rex Hunter or Cannibal Dinosaur tier than Bloody's Battle or Ice Age Monsters tier. My next analysis will be of episode 11, Raptors vs. T-Rex, as well as um, stuff about the final episode, Armageddon. And after that, I will wrap up Jurassic Fight Club with a series-wide analysis slash retrospective, as well as some suggestions as to how I would improve the show. But before we get to that, we'll get back to natural history with a remastered version of Tyrannosaurids Part 1, as well as Tyrannosaurids Part 2. That's all for today. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. And I hope you learned something new today. And as always, this is PaleoNerd, signing out.